Welcome to Bold City on YouTube as we continue the Lightwalker series. I'm Pastor Randy, and today we're going to be in 1 John chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 24, so uh, get your Bibles out. We're ready to jump in. We'd also like you to like our page, uh, to subscribe to it, and uh, to know that there are more uh, teachings on this. You can check those out on our online or on our app and to find out more about the, the Light Walker series. So let's uh, jump in today. First John chapter 3, verse 10 through 24. This second message on uh, chapter 3 will focus on the marks of God's love in our life. You know, as children of God, we uh, have engaged with God's love. We've encountered God's love, but now we got to know what's different about our lives. How, how do we live? How does the world know that? Do we really love God? And is his love being reflected in us? Do we love God? Do we love others? And how far are we really willing to go to show that? The, the greatest proof that we love God we're going to see in these verses, the greatest proof that we love God is that we love others. We're called to make a difference, and we're called to love others. Now, let's set the stage before we get into the marks of God's love. What is love? We know that God is love. In, chap in chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 16, John just says God is love. He's not about love. He doesn't talk of love. He is the embodiment of love. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the famous passage on love, we find out some of the things. We know that love is patient, that love is kind. And then we go into some things. Love's not going to be jealous. It's not going to be proud. It's not going to be arrogant. It's not going to be rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered or provoked. It doesn't rejoice in injustices of any kind, whether you agree with them or not, but it rejoices with the truth. One of my favorite parts of this verse says, love bears all things. It believes or it looks for the best in people, believes all things, that it remains hopeful and that it endures through the storms of life. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. And it tells us, man, what a definition of love. Man, if these things are in your life or not in your life, that's the, that's the telltale sign. So it's important and it's time for us to look in the mirror and to be honest about what we see. When we look in the mirror, does our life reflect the love of God? Does our life look like God? Does it, does it reflect his love for him and for others? And if something needs to change or if something needs to be adjusted as a child of God, we got to make that happen. We've got to be willing to make that happen. The good news is that God does not expect us to do any of this on our own. Thankfully, we have had a salvation experience, but even Jesus told the disciples in Acts chapter 2, don't you leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. What was the promise of the Father? The baptism in the Holy Spirit, the, the empowerment from the Holy Spirit to direct us, to lead us, to guide us, which is a whole nother teaching of, from John chapter uh, 14, 15, and 16. But he gives us the Holy Spirit to empower us, to help us make the changes so that when we look in the mirror, we actually see the love of God reflecting back. So what are the marks of God's love? Well, John begins to explain some of these, and I want to look at them today. What are the evidence of love in our life, the marks that God wants of love that he wants to, us to reflect in our life? Let's look in verse 10. It says, in this, the children of God and the children, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is he who does not love his brother. So the very first verse right there, he says, this is the litmus test. The mark of God's love really reveals who's your daddy, who you're following. It reveals your true nature, whose family you are reflecting. You know, John identifies two families. He says there's the children of God and there's the children of the devil. Now that sounds harsh, but the truth is, is how you love and how you behave reflects who you follow. Pretty simple. Do you make righteous choices? Do you love others? Or are you selfish and self-centered and me-centered and it's all about what I want? John leaves no middle ground. It's going to be one or the other. You're either in this family or in that family. And the choices you make have the impact on your life. It reveals the truth of who you really are and who you belong to. You know, growing up, I knew that I was Ann and Ted's kid, that, that, that I was the son of Ted and Ann Scalise. 
because of how I acted, because of how I responded, and people would see that. It's natural. Oh, he's acting just like you, or he's acting just like your dad, or he's acting just like, and, and it's because they raised me and they, they were teaching me. I was part of that family. They were the ones I spent the most time with. So ask yourself, who are you hanging out with? Who's in your circle? Paul reminds us this powerful verse in Corinthians. He says, bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. So who are you hanging out with? You know, if you want to know what family you're in, take a look at who you're around and who's around you. Proverbs 13, 20 says, if you walk with the wise, you'll be wise. So who are the influencers in your life? So the first mark is that whose family are you in? Who's your daddy? The second mark is of God's love is not a new command. It's not an, an, a new thing that we're having to figure. We got to go back to, to what was he originally saying. Look in verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. God's message is that we love one another. People are always looking for the next best thing. They get tired. They get bored. They get, they get over it. But some things don't change, and some things don't need to change. God's word in the Old Testament is echoed in the New. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, he told the people, love your neighbor. Well, then Jesus shows up and he sums up the law in two phrases. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so it's not a new command. It's a command that's being given a new spin. It's being given new truth. He's saying, listen, I want you to love others. That's the mark of a believer, that we love others. Paul told the Romans, he said, leave no debt outstanding. Always pay your debts. Accept the continuing debt to love one another. You are always going to be needing and indebted to loving one another. This coming from a guy who was taking a beating from the religious folks. He was getting attacked. He was getting uh, beaten. He was getting ridiculed. He was getting mocked. He was rejected. But he just kept loving. Why? Because he was going after people with the love of Jesus. God told him to tell the Gentiles, and the Jews didn't like it. But he kept doing it because God's love is for all. He loves all his creation. Let me say something about God's love that, that's just powerful. He may not agree with your behavior, but he still loves the person. And he still has hopes and desires and, and offers you a choice to join his family. We could use more of this love in our culture today. I love how the, the Passion Translation uh, describes verse 11. It says, walking in, walking in self-sacrificing love towards others a loving generosity. The mark of a true, uh, the mark of love is that we love not just ourselves, but we love others. The mark of God's love also does not persecute the righteous. Look in verse 12 and verse 13. Not as Cain, who was a, was the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother was righteous? He says, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world actually hates you. To persecute righteousness, you know, Cain just set out and did it. To persecute means to oppress, to pursue, to harass, to bully, or to harm. This make life miserable, especially because of their race, their political belief, or their religious belief. There's a lot of persecution going on in our world today on both sides. John gives us a negative example. He says, Cain did not love his brother. He was wicked. He was selfish. He envied his brother. Why? Because Abel did the righteous things. Abel did the right things. He was accepted by God. People have a real problem. They have a real problem when anyone else is being blessed. Somebody else gets a promotion. Somebody else gets a raise. Somebody else has nice things. And we say, it's just not fair. It's just not right. Cain hated his brother. And many will hate us for living righteously and for loving others. How could anyone be upset with, with, with living right? But somebody will. You know, our church is, is going to do a turkey outreach. We're going to give to families over Thanksgiving. And sure enough, somebody at Thanksgiving, somebody at Christmas, somebody at Easter, they're going to get all upset because we did it this way and we didn't do it that way, and they just get frustrated. 
True disciples need to understand that the world is going to hate us because we do the right things, but that's no excuse to persecute people because they're doing the right thing. True disciples need to realize that the world is going to hate us for all the wrong reasons. Shouldn't be that way, but we shouldn't be shocked. We shouldn't be surprised. You see, they hated Jesus, so they're going to hate us. If I'm going to be hated, if I'm going to be hated, then let me be hated for doing the right things, for, being, for standing up for truth, for standing up for righteousness, because I'm a child of God, because I'm obeying the Father, because I'm being a blessing to others. You know, that's, that's the true mark of a child of God and a mark of love. How about another one? The mark of God's love is proof that we've moved from death to life. Look at verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides or remains in death. John is talking about uh, spiritual death. He's talking about eternal death and life and moving uh, from death to life. He's not talking about a physical death. The evidence of a changed life is that we love our brothers. And if we don't love and if we don't help, then what happens is we remain in a death cycle. We remain spiritually separated and disconnected from God. Here's the good news. It's a choice. You can change families. You can move from, from being a child of the devil to being a child of God. It's all a choice. It's possible to be adopted into a new family. You can move from death to life. You can, it's evidence that you're, that, you, that you're a child of God. It's evidence that your life is marked with love, but it's also proof that you can move from one family to another. Think about all the children who've been rejected by their parents or neglected or who've had a parent die, but they've been welcomed or adopted into a new family. You know, when I married Gina, she did not have to adopt my son Josiah from my first marriage. My first wife passed away. You know, he already had my name. She was coming in and got my name. On the surface, we looked like a family, and we had all that that, that, was, that was needed. But she wanted Josiah to know that she chose him, that she decided to adopt him and legally make him her son. And this is moving from death to life. This is a choice to be, to raise him as her own. The evidence of a life that has changed is found in loving our brothers and our sisters as ourselves. The proof is that we've moved from death to life, that we've made that, that change. Another mark of God's love is that we do not hate. Love does not hate. Look at verse 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. John's not talking about just hating something or, or hating to go somewhere. He's talking about the spirit of hate. When you really dig into this verse, you realize that he's not just talking about, I hate to go here and I hate to do that. He's talking about a deep-seated spirit of anger and of resentment that dominates a mindset and behaviors. It's a spirit of hate. Love doesn't hate. Even Jesus said hatred is the same thing as murder. In Matthew chapter 5, he said, you know, you hate your brother. It's as good as murder. Why? Because it kills, murder kills a, 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 a person. Hate kills a relationship. Cain hated his brother Abel. Hatred is to commit murder in your heart. It cuts off fellowship. It removes the opportunity to speak and to present life to that person. You know what's crazy as you look at this and you can get bogged down in it so easy is that John's talking to believers. He's talking to you and me. He's saying you and I can, it is possible for a Christian to wander off into the dark side of hatred, to kind of, to get frustrated, to get angry, to let the flesh take over. When a believer drifts into darkness, it doesn't mean that they immediately lose their salvation. They can, it can happen. But what it means is that as you begin to drift, as you let hatred seep into your life, you, you impact and you lose the intimacy and the favor with God. You're not as close to him. Your, your relationship with him is hindered. It's being cut off because God expects us to love one another. Here's a powerful truth. God expects us to love one another, not agree with each other. 
We're not always going to agree. We're not always going to appreciate and agree with the decisions that other people make, but we must love one another. Don't say that just because I disagree with you, now I can hate you. No, love doesn't hate. Some would look at them and say, well, God's doing this to me. When the truth is, is that we wandered off. We wandered off. It's time to look in the mirror. So one of the marks of love is that we don't hate our brother. Look in verse 16. We see the mark of God's love proves that we appreciate the love of Jesus. Verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, this is one of the key verses in this chapter. He's explaining this is what Jesus has done. How easily we forget all that God has done for us. Listen, never let yourself get so familiar with the story of Jesus and with the transformation that he's made in your life. Don't, let, don't ever let it not stir you that, you that you get cold to it. Your past is something that should not dominate you, but it should remind you of the, and appreciate who God is and what he's done. He came as your substitute. He laid down his life for you. He resurrected for you. It's what he did that's changed your life. So don't let your past consume you. Let it inspire you. You know, 2 Corinthians, Paul told them, you're a new creature in Christ. Listen, that was the old man. That was the old Randy. That was the old one. Now I'm a new person. I have new opportunities. I'm connected to the source of all power and all wisdom. All that Christ has done, all that he sacrificed, Jesus is God's definition of love. Jesus is God's expression of love to us, and he wants us to love others like that. You know what Jesus told us in John chapter 15? He said, greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his brothers. The real mark of love is not in loving those who like us. It's in loving those who don't. That's truly appreciating, because that's appreciating Christ's love for us. Romans 5, 8, one of my favorite verses, while we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love towards us. He died for us. He died for us. So one of the marks of God's love is that God's love proves that we appreciate who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. Never let that become so familiar. How about verse 17? But whoever has this word, has the world's goods, and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? You know, the mark of God's love here is that God's love has compassion, and it gives to people in need. We see the needs around us, and we respond. Now, here's a gut punch. Love is generous. Love is generous. It doesn't hoard or hold back. It sees the need, and it helps. John is saying this, if you're able to help someone, help where you can, help how you can. Now, is this a mandate that we're supposed to give all our money away to every person that asks for it? No, it's an instruction that we remain sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. That's the difference. It's not that every time you see someone who needs help, you're supposed to unload your bank account. What it means is that you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading and you see the need and you ask, what's my responsibility here? What can I do? Not every need is financial and not every need needs money thrown at it. People need friendship. People need encouragement. Maybe somebody needs a ride. Maybe somebody needs a networking connection. They need you to introduce them to someone or or to, to give them wisdom or to give them instruction or information. But if you're disconnected from God's love, if you're not operating in God's love, then you're not going to hear his voice. That's why the quiet place, the secret place is so important in our life. It's tuning into God's direction like a radio station, whether you had to use a dial in the old school way or you've got the little digital. If you're off just one point or if you're off just a little bit, you know, all you hear is static or you just hear it come in and out, in and out. But if you fine tune and you get in, you can hear clearly what that station is wanting to tell you. God wants us to dial in with him and to be tuned into his presence so that we can can have compassion and know what our responsibility is to bless others. 
And God wants us to bless others, not just throw money at them, but to bless them responsibly. The mark of God's love is that we have compassion and we give to those in need. Verse 18 is a kicker. Look at this. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. He's not saying that what we say is unimportant. What he's saying is, is that the mark of God's love is action. Action. Don't just talk about it. Simply put, walk what you talk. So many Christians have information and not application. We heard our pastor say this last week, that you can know 60, 70 scriptures, but the real valuable thing is that you live them and that you walk them out. I love how Tony Evans puts it. He says this, what your lips proclaim, your life must support. If you're going to talk it, then you got to walk it. God's description about love in 1 Corinthians 13 that we read at the beginning, it's not about a feeling. Love's not a feeling. Love's a choice that we make. It's the nature of who God is. It's about deliberate actions that the believer makes and takes. I've heard it said that the world doesn't care how much you know until they know how much you care, until you speak into their life. You know, our church is is powerful. It loves our community. And Bold City is going to invest money into our families through our turkey outreach and and through our Christmas and through our Easter and and through disaster relief. It sends a message of love. It sends uh, an accurate representation of a loving father that we care about what you're going through because one of the marks of love is action. So as we close up this passage, I see two benefits to love and action. If we really are active with our love, there are two things that happen. One, we get assurance, and two, we get answered prayer. One, we get assurance, and two, we get answered prayer. Verse 19 says, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, We have confidence towards God. What he's saying is you're not led by your conscience, but God gives us our conscience. He gives us that inner knowing in us that when we do something wrong, we know it. When when we've messed up, we know it. Our conscience convicts us. It's one more way to hear from God. And he says that we want to have a clear conscience. We want to be obedient. When you're loving and when you're active and when you're being obedient and you're following after God, what he's saying is this, is that your conscience will be clear and that you will have confidence and you will have assurance from God. You will have confidence in spite of what you see, in spite of what you feel, in spite of what you think, in spite of what you've been told by others. Because our assurance is not anchored just in what we do, but it's anchored in the hope of God, the presence of God, the purpose of God, and the mish, the family of God. When our hearts are open and clean before God, he says, listen, you have confidence. You have confidence, hey amen, that you're walking in the right ways and in the ways of God. You have assurance. So love and action brings assurance. And brings confidence. And it also answers our prayer. Listen to this. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now that just sounds like a name and claim it verse. Man, if I ask anything, God's going to give it to me. But we stop at that comma and we say, if we ask for anything, we have it. But it's the rest of it that really makes sense. Because we obey his commands and we do what pleases him. Listen, our prayers are answered because we obey his commands and we please the Father by walking in alignment with him. I want you to know that obedience is the mark of true love. It's the mark of true love, whether you're in or out. It's the evidence. It's the key to having our prayers answered as well. I've always said, if you walk it out, he'll work it out. God wants to answer your prayer, but he wants you to get in alignment with him. When we obey God, when we do what he wants, we eventually want what he wants for us. I know that's subtle, but we eventually want what he wants for us. And if we want what God wants us to have, then guess what? When we ask for the things that he wants us to have, we're going to get them. God says, get in alignment with me. 
and I'll give you assurance and I'll give you answers. So what are the commands? Well, I got to obey every command. Listen, obey the commands that you know. You know the command, love one another. That's the basic one we've been talking about. But John even spells it out in verse 20, uh, verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us his commandment. Listen, what he's saying is this. Here's the command. Believe in Jesus, trust in him, follow him, and then love others. That's what he's calling us to do. That's where we get the assurance. And then he sums it up in verse 24. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him. We stay with him, we remain in him, and he remains in us. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he's given us. Listen, you don't have to do this on your own. God's given us the Holy Spirit to help us. You know, the marks of God's love is a life that's lived for him and with him. And when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Are there things that, do you see the love of God? Do you see a child of God? Do you see things that need to change or be adjusted? Then work on those things. Are you struggling with the answers? Are you struggling with assurance? You know, I want you to know you don't, God's there for you. You don't have to do this on your own. Maybe you're in obedience with God. You're just walking through some difficult times right now. Just know that God loves you and God cares about you. This is the Lightwalker series. It's about shining the light of God's love in our life so that we can share it with others and so that they can know the hope of Christ. I hope that this series is being a blessing to you, that this chapter has been a blessing to you, and that you'll check out chapter four, chapter five, and maybe some of the other teachings uh, on our website or on our app. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. God bless you.